Cicero, in defence of Sextus Roscius of Ameria, speech delivered in 80 BCE, part 2, translated by Michael Grant, narrated by Max Latham. The deputation arrived at the camp. It is perfectly clear, gentlemen, as I said before, that all these outrageous crimes were committed without Sulla knowing anything about them. For it was Chrysogonus who now took all the action. He immediately went to meet the delegates himself. He also commissioned certain high-ranking people to dissuade them from approaching Sulla in person, and told them to guarantee that he, Chrysogonus, would do everything they wanted, for so bad was his conscience that he would rather have died than let Sulla discover about the things that had been happening. As for the delegates, they were men of old-world simplicity who judged other people's characters by their own. When, therefore, Chrysogonus promised them that he himself would remove the elder Sextus Roscius' name from the list of the prescribed and would hand over the entire property to his son, and when Capito, who was actually one of the ten envoys, added his own assurance to the same effect, they believed what they were told, and returned to Ameria without presenting their petition to Sulla at all. Chrysogonus and Capito, however, continually delayed the fulfilment of the promises they had made, procrastinating from one day to the next. Shortly afterwards they began to display even more uncooperative behaviour, which amounted to, indeed, nothing less than downright fraud. It was easy enough to see where this was leading. And so it now turned out, for at that juncture they started plotting against the younger Sextus Roscius's life. Evidently they doubted their capacity to hang on to another man's property while the real owner remained alive still. When the state of affairs had dawned upon my client, he took the advice of his friends and relations and fled to Rome. He went to Caecilia Metella, Nepos's sister. Her father was Bala Euricus, a name I mention with respect. She had been a friend of Sextus Roscius's father, and let me add, judges, that she has universally agreed to be a woman blessed with an old-fashioned and exemplary sense of duty. And so Roscius, now destitute, cast out of his house, expelled from his possessions, a fugitive from his plunderers and all their weapons and menaces, was received by Caecilia Metella into her own home. Crushing troubles had overtaken him, and everyone regarded his case as desperate. Yet she made him her guest, and came to his help. It is thanks to her goodness and loyalty and energy that he is still alive, that his name can still be entered on the charge sheet. Otherwise the only list to display it would have been the fraudulent list of the prescribed, for he would have been struck down and put to death. As it turned out, However, his life was now protected with the utmost care. His enemies noticed this, and saw that they were not going to be given the opportunity to assassinate him. This being so, they formed an alternative design, and an infamous and horrible design it was. For they decided instead to accuse him of murdering his own father. They planned for this purpose to get hold of some prosecutor who was an old hand, and who could always think up something to say, even when, as here, the defendant was not under the slightest trace of suspicion. Since, however, the charge itself was clearly lacking in all substance, they proposed to use the circumstances of the times as a weapon. For because, they reflected, there had not been a single trial for parricide for a very long time indeed, it was highly probable that the first person to be brought to trial on such a charge would be found guilty. Moreover, the influence of Chrysogonus, it seemed to them, would be enough to ensure that no one would come forward to act as Sextus Roscius's advocate. For the same reason, no one was likely to utter a word about the sale of the property of the partnership relating to its purchase. The mere designation of parricide, they concluded, the horrible nature of such a charge would be enough to get rid of Sextus Roscius without the slightest difficulty. Indeed, it was certain that no one would come forward to defend him. Such, then, was the plan of action, the maniacal plot which they entered upon, with the intention that the man whom they themselves had wanted to assassinate, but could not contrive to do so, should be murdered by you, instead, on their behalf. This is all so terrible that it is hard to know at which of the many points involved one censure ought to start. But one thing I can say, 
I only wish I knew which way I could turn to find other people who would help me. If at least some names were forthcoming, it would be the greatest possible relief. And whether it is the immortal gods whose protection I should be begging for, or the people of Rome, I really do not know. Or, best of all, gentlemen, should it not rather be yourselves? For at this juncture it is you who have been given the supreme power to make the decision. Here is the foul murder of a father, his home besieged and captured by his enemies, his goods grabbed and stolen and looted, his son's life in the gravest danger, repeatedly attacked by both open violence and by secret treacherous snares. Well, that is a list of crimes which might seem to include every category of, e category of evil doing that you can think of, but apparently not. For somehow or other, these individuals managed to extend and expand the grim list by concocting a fresh set of crimes altogether. They invent an accusation that totally exceeds belief. Not only do they succeed in procuring false witnesses and prosecutors against my client, but they actually pay them with his own money. And finally, they confront their wretched victim with these alternatives. Either he offers up his throat voluntarily to Magnus, or he must die the most degrading of all possible deaths, with his living body sewn up inside a sack, the penalty for parricide. When his enemies believed he would f be short of defenders, they were perfectly correct. But all the same, he will have had the services of one man who is prepared to speak out freely and defend him with devotion, and in a case as strong as this, gentlemen, that is all he'll need. Perhaps in undertaking the task I have acted with youthful rashness. Nevertheless, having once accepted the commission, no matter what the terrors and dangers may threaten me on every side, by heaven I am going to save him. Nothing would induce me to let him down. I am determined to bring forward every single point that I believe to have bearing on this case, and I shall bring them forward boldly and frankly, without the slightest constraint. Nothing that can possibly happen will frighten me out of doing my duty, for I cannot believe that anyone in the world would be so lacking in moral sense that he could witness these crimes and stand by and disregard them, holding his peace. You were the assassins of my father, my client tells his foes. In his lifetime, he declares my father was never prescribed. It was only after he was killed that you people got his name inserted onto the prescription list. You drove me out of my house by force, he says. You seized my entire heritage. What do you want next? Are you actually venturing to brandish your lethal weapons yet again, here in this very court, intending on getting Sextus Roski as condemned to death by legal pro process, if you cannot murder him yourselves? By far the most ferocious personality we have known in politics during the recent years was Gaius Flavius Fimbria. He was also, it was generally agreed, the craziest of the whole lot, except in the opinion of the people who are lunatics themselves. At the funeral funeral of Gaius Marius, it was he who was responsible for the wounding of Quintus Mucius Skywola Pontifex. Skywola was the most revered and illustrious figure in our whole national history, though this is not the place to sing his praises. In any case, the good people of Rome remember him so well that there is little I could add to their memories. After the deed, when we heard that Skywola might possibly recover from his wound, Fimbria proceeded to lodge a charge against him whereupon someone was reported to have asked him what accusation he could possibly be proposing to bring against a man whose noble qualities were beyond all praise. And Fimbria, like the madman he was, is said to have replied, because Skywola failed to submit his body to the full thrust of the sword, a more disgraceful thing never occurred in the history of our country, except Skywola's actual murder, which indeed followed later. So deplorable were his consequences that one may regard it, without exaggeration, as having brought ruin upon every single citizen of Rome. His whole aim had been to save them. That is why he wanted to bring about reconciliation between the two sides, and yet it was actually the people he wanted to save who struck him down. Surely the present case exhibits striking analogies to what Fimbria said and did. You set yourselves up as the accusers of the younger Sextus Roscius, but why? because he escaped from your clutches and refused to be murdered. Fimbria's deed may seem more scandalous of the two, because its victim was the famous Skywola. But the present atrocity does not become any easier to endure just because its perpetrator was the famous Chrysogonus. Indeed, 
Heaven only knows how the present trial can really be thought to require any case for the defence at all. I cannot see that it raises a single point demanding an advocate's ingenuity or an orator's eloquence. However, gentlemen, we must go over every detail all the same. When the entire picture has been assembled before our eyes, we shall be able to see where we have got to. My survey will be designed to show you the basis of the whole matter, and the fundamental issues that it raises, and the considerations which, in my opinion, ought to guide the decision you will then be called upon to take. There is the violence, and there is the power, and the prosecutor, Erucius, has undertaken to concoct the charge. As for the violence, Magnus and Capito have claimed this speciality for their own, and what Chrysogonus has contributed to the contest, since he is the most powerful, is his power. Now I can very well see that it is my duty to discuss each of these three aspects in turn, but how had I better proceed? Clearly I cannot deal with all three points in one and the same way, because the first relates to my own personal duty, whereas the responsibility relating to the other two has been assigned to the Roman people and to yourselves. The charge, that is to say, is for me to refute, whereas the repression of violence is your job, and when we come to the third point, what you have got to do at the very first possible opportunity is to crush and stamp out the power, the lethal and insufferable power that has fallen into the hands of scoundrels of the type that we are concerned with today. The younger Sextus Roscius is accused of having killed his father. Oh, heavens, what a crime! A crime so foul and loathsome that it seems to combine every single kind of guilt you can ever think of. The philosophers declare very aptly that even a mere facial expression can be a breach of filial duty. Well, in that case, it is impossible to imagine what punishment could be frightful enough for someone who has actually put his own parent to death. That person, on whose behalf the laws of the gods and men alike require that he should willingly die himself, if he should be called upon to do so. In the case of a criminal act so hateful, so unique, so utterly exceptional, that whatever it occurs it seems to portend and monstrosity, you will certainly have to think very hard, Erucius, about the arguments that your role as prosecutor demands. Presumably you will have to demonstrate that the man you are charged, charging with such an act is an abnormally violent individual. No doubt you will want to indicate that he is a person of savage and brutish nature, whose whole life is given up to every sort of vicious and infamous behaviour, in short, that his entire character is ruinously perverted and depraved. And yet, strangely enough, you have not attempted to bring a single one of these imputations against my client, not even by way of the usual kind of routine abuse. Sextus Roscius, you say, killed his father. Well, what sort of person is he, then? Obviously, he must be some degenerate youth who has been corrupted by men of evil character. On the contrary, he is over forty years old. Well, then... He must be a veteran, cutthroat, a ferocious individual, thoroughly accustomed to committing murders. But the prosecutor has never even begun to suggest anything of the sort. So I suppose he must have been driven to his criminal act by extravagant habits, or huge debts, or ungovernable passions. As regards to extravagant living, Arucius himself has already cleared him of what he indicated that the sex has hardly ever even attended a party. Debts? He never had any. Passions? Not so much scope for these in a man who, as the prosecutor himself critically remarked, has always lived in the country, devoting his time to the cultivation of his lands. One may well ask, then, what on earth could have prompted the insane act Sex Roscius is charged with? His father disliked him, explains the prosecution. All right, then. But what was the cause of this dislike? Surely there must have been some valid and substantial and unmistakable cause for a feeling. For a father is not likely to hate his son without numerous well-grounded and cogent reasons, any more than a son is likely to kill his father without motives that are equally weighty, indeed overwhelming. So I return to my point, and ask once again what the grave faults are in the son which caused his own father to hate him. However, it is abundantly evident that no such faults exist, so we must assume that the father was out of his mind, if, without any reason at all, he conceived this hatred for the son he himself had begotten. But it was certainly not the case. On the contrary, he was an exceedingly stable character. It is perfectly clear, then, that since the father was a sane man, as any could possibly be, and the son led a life that was quiet, the opposite of vicious, the father had no motive for hating his son, and the son had no motive for murdering his father. 
what the reason f for the hatred was, answers the prosecutor. I have no idea. All I know is that it existed, because previously, when the father had two living sons, it was the other one, now dead, whom we always wanted to have with him, whereas he sent this one away to, to his farms in the country. Now, although my case is impregnable, in sharp contrast to Erukius's charge, which is both wicked and frivolous, it does so happen that that line of argument he puts forward here places the perilous in a very compatible situation, and it is rather an embarrassing one, but he can find no proof of support in his fraudulent charge, and I likewise can find no way of disproving allegations that are so utterly ridiculous. However, I take it, Erukius, that what you are really trying to say is this, Sextus Roscius gave his son all those excellent productive farms to cultivate and manage merely to get him out of the way and punish him. Yet surely the exact opposite must have been the truth. The father, rather, is that the heads of the household, especially the men of the elder Sextus Roscius's rank in the country towns, regard it as highly advantageous to themselves, if they have children, that their sons should devote themselves very thoroughly indeed to the management of their property, and lavish the most careful attention upon the cultivation of their farms. You can't expect us to believe that Roscius sent his son away to the country merely in order to segregate him down there at the farmhouse and deprive him of every amenity of life except his bare subsistence. So, I want to put this question to you. If, it turns out, instead to be a proved fact that the younger Sextus not only superintended the cultivation of the estates, but also, during the father's lifetime, was permitted to the privilege of keeping the full enjoyment of certain farms to himself, will you still, in spite of that, persist in the stigmatizer of his life as an unfriendly dismissal and banishment to the depths of the country? You see, Arucius, there is a total discrepancy between the line of argument you are trying to adopt and the actual facts of the case. What fa fathers habitually and normally do, you attempt to find fault with a strange kind of innovation. What is, in reality, a sign of affectionate kindness is interpreted by you as a mark of hatred. When the father has been generous to his son, to show what a good opinion he holds of him, you describe it as punishment. And all these misrepresentations, you cannot be attributed to foolishness on your part. The fact is that you have so exceedingly few arguments to put forward that you cannot merely limit yourself to trying to refute my case. No, you have to try to do more, so you find yourself constrained to arguing against the whole array of definite facts, indeed against the customs and convictions of all mankind. However, you still press the point that Sextus Roscius had two sons and kept one of them always by his side, whereas he let the other one stay in the country. Now, Arucius, Please do not take offence about what I am going to say next. I assure you I shall not be saying it just in order to be unpleasant, but because you need a reminder. Even if fortune has not given you the advantage of knowing for certain who your father was, which would have given you a better idea of how a father feels towards his children, at any rate has endowed you with your fair share of human feelings. And you have a studious disposition as well, so that literary illusions are not beyond you, that being so, let me borrow the question I want to ask you from the comic drama. I want you to consider one of those plays written by Caecilius Statius, and let me know if, in your opinion, the old man in the play really thinks less of his son Ectius, who lived in the country, than of his other son, whose name, I believe, was Caerestratus. Please tell me whether, in your opinion, he kept Caerestratus with him in the city as a mark of respect, and whether he banished the other son in order to punish him. But why, you will say, do you have to stray off to into irrelevant literary queries of such a kind? All right, then, I can equally well assure you that I have no difficulty whatsoever without calling upon any such theoretical illustrations at all in bringing forward a great many names on my own living fellow tribesmen, or neighbours who are every bit as keen as their favourite son should be conscientious farmers. However, I prefer not to quote real, well-known people, if I can possibly help it, because one doesn't know whether they would like their names to be mentioned in this way. Another reason why I refrain from doing so is because, in any case, you yourself are not likely to be any better acquainted with such people than you are with this Aictus I was speaking about. And, besides, it makes not the slightest bit of difference to the validity of my argument whether I use the name of this young man in the comic play or some actual real person, say, from the territory of Vei. 
After all, the reason why the poets invented these stories was surely just this, so that we should be able to see our own behaviour mirrored in these other imaginary characters, which thus cast a vivid light upon our own daily lives. However, by all means turn your attention back to the actual realities, if that is what you prefer, and consider what occupations meet with the greatest approval from the actual heads of country households, both in Umbria and in the surrounding districts, and, for that matter, in the long-established municipalities nearer at hand. And there you will certainly find it confirmed that the position of the younger Sextus Roskis, which your dearth of convicting accusations against him, convincing accusations against him, has made you present as a fault and a crime, does him, on the contrary. It does him a great deal of credit. And it isn't just out of obedience to their father's wishes that the sons dedicate themselves to agriculture. I have come across a great many people, and so, unless I am entirely mistaken, has everyone present in this court who are extremely fond of this pursuit, quite often of their own accord. There is a widespread feeling that country life, which you assail as a disgraceful slur, is instead the most honourable and enjoyable existence that any man can possibly lead. And just think of the knowledge and skill which Re Sextus Roscius displays in agricultural matters. I learn from his excellent relatives here that he is every bit as knowledgeable about such questions as you are about your profession as a prosecutor. True, by courtesy of Chrysogonus, who has not left him a single farm, he will now be in an excellent position to forget all this expert knowledge and abandon his interest in the subject. That would be a shame and a tragedy. And yet, even so, he will endure such a fate patiently enough, gentlemen, provided only that your verdict enables him to save his honour and his own life. But really, if we are going to have to conclude that he owes his present lamentable situation to the quantity of and excellence of his farms, if the care he has taken to develop them is going to count against him more than anything else, then what an insufferable state of affairs we have come to! Surely it is a misfortune enough that others derive profits from the cultivation upon which he has lavished so much care, without making it a further crime that he ever engaged in his cultivation of lands in the first place. I am afraid you would have cut a ludicrous figure in your job, Eruchius, if you had been born in the times when men used to be called from their ploughs to become consuls. For since you regard it as such a crime to be an agriculturalist, then obviously the famous Attilius, whom the envoys found sowing seed with his own hand, would have seemed to you a thoroughly degraded and disreputable person. But heaven knows our ancestors took a singularly different view about Attilius, and about all the others who were like him. And theirs was the attitude that made this country rise out of insignificance and poverty into the imposing and prosperous commonwealth that they have handed down to ourselves. The transfiguration was due to the meticulous care that they dedicated to the cultivation of their lands. To covet and hanker after their properties belonging to other people did not even occur to them. And yet it was hard work in the long run which enabled them to bestow whole territories and cities, even nations, upon our Republic and Roman Empire, to the greater glory of Rome. 